Today is July the 18th, 2017. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University, and today I am in Broken Arrow to speak with Sandy Schwinn, and this is part of our Spotlight in Oklahoma project with a focus on the monarchs here in Oklahoma. So thank you for having me today. Um, she, by the way, she is a retired educator and also known as the Butterfly Lady. Get it all in there. Uh, let's begin with learning a little bit about you. When and where were you born? Um, I was born um, on January 6, 1948 in Oklahoma City. Um, my parents, Ralph and Louise Medore, were veterans in World War II, both of them. My mother was an Army nurse and my dad was a uh, staff sergeant. So mom was in London during uh, D-Day invasion in a hospital, and my dad was in the Aleutian Islands. Wow. Yeah. And how did they end up in Oklahoma? Well, they were both uh, from Oklahoma. Okay. And my mom um, had gone to nursing school with my dad's sister. So when they all came, and when they both came back from the war, um, the sister uh, introduced them and. My mom was living in Oklahoma City where my dad was, and uh, his sister was, and so that's how they got together. Cool. That's cool too, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have brothers and sisters? I have two sisters that are younger. I'm the oldest. Mm -hmm. the oldest and in charge. Huh? Uh, uh, no, <laughs> not in charge. <laughs> that's the way it was in my house. I'm the middle. Oh, okay. My older was in charge. <laughs> And did they, uh, so they were from Oklahoma, from Oklahoma City, or from another um, part? Dad was from Noble, our uh, um, um, Norman area, and they had a farm down in around uh, Lake Thunderbird, and then Mom was from Guthrie. Okay. And my great-great-grandfather was in the land run, so uh, that's how they ended up in Guthrie. And from where? Where, where, had, they, where had he come in from? They came in from um, Illinois through Missouri and then into Oklahoma. They, they had 160 acres or? Um, well, it was a 40 acre allotment at that point in time. I, I know, I'm not for sure. It's still in the family, but it's not in, we don't have it. It went to another, um, I think the oldest brother, my grandfather was not the oldest child. And so, um, and I'm not for sure how many acres it is now. It was, um, but they did farm. My great grandfather, Price Billings. It's my understanding that he was a member of the territorial legislature. So, so your roots go deep. Oh yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. that would have been Logan County. No, yes, yes. Logan County. Mm -hmm. Okay. And where where did you go to elementary school? Putnam City. I actually went there uh, to Putnam City all the way through. In one building? No, several buildings. Okay. Mm -hmm. I started at the original, which is on 39th Street, which that was the original, and then and, um, we ended up, the first elementary off uh, campus was um, Hilldale, and so we ended up going, I ended up going there in sixth grade, and then I graduated on the original campus, and then my sisters, each, one of them, I think, graduated from Putnam City West. Of course, it's great big now. It's all over the place, kind of like Jinx and Union and all the other schools. Mm -hmm. And what year did you graduate? Uh, 66. 66. And did you have a favorite subject? Mm, I loved art. Um, I think art. <laughs> <laughs> but probably... Um, I enjoyed my English teacher my senior year, okay. who really introduced me to a lot of classics. And so your, your, after the war, they came back and settled, stayed in Oklahoma City area, your parents mm -hmm. stayed there. Mm -hmm. Your mother continued to nurse. She stayed home and then she became a school nurse as we got older. Okay. Well, actually, you know, she did work when I was little part-time at the hospital, but then as we got older and there were three of us, she went, she was a school nurse for Oklahoma City Schools. Okay. And then what did your dad end up doing? He was a welder. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then once you finished high school, take us through your college. I ended up going to OBU, Oklahoma Baptist University in Shawnee. Okay. And I got a degree, a double major in education and psychology. And then I went 
to work for uh, Oklahoma City Public Schools my first year out and taught for them for um, three years. And then met my husband who was here in Tulsa. We were a um, blind date through friends that I knew in Norman. And um, so I moved over here and then taught here in Tul for Tulsa Public Schools until I had my first child. Okay. And you teaching English or? No, I was an elementary teacher. Elementary? Uh -huh. What grade? Um, oh my goodness, let's see. Um, fourth grade, um, um, we had a uh, second through fourth um, and then uh, most, uh, then I taught third grade, I taught second grade, and then I ended up as a reading specialist. I did go back and get my master's after uh, my kids were, uh, when my kids were probably about, um, they were, my daughter was probably, my daughter, when I finished up, my daughter was um, in sixth grade and my son in second grade, actually third Seventh, I'm sorry, but anyway, I did uh, go back because I let my um, when I became a mom, I let my certification lapse. <laughs> it happens, uh -huh, it does, and then you know, didn't I wasn't didn't have the foresight when I. <laughs> but mm -hmm. where did you get that? Your teacher uh, in issue yeah. in um, right Tahlequah, but I did it here locally because we had the uh, the. Uh, center here where they had four uh, schools, OSU and, and uh, NSU and uh, OU and Langston at that point in time. They started the, the uh, Tulsa, um, I, don't know what to, I don't remember what the name of it was now, it's been too many years ago. <laughs> but they actually, that's when, how they started the school and now it's OSU school. So like in the 80s, 90s, 90s, what toward the... Um, it would have been in the... Um, it was in the 80s. I think it's when Penny Williams was in the state legislature. She was pushing for some of that. So I think it would have been that. Right. So we it was it was a chance for people here. We had of course we had TU, but a chance for people to get uh, have uh, other options. It was a mm -hmm. good move. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy doing the elementary school grades? Mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. I always loved that. Which would be harder, the second grade or the fourth grade? To teach. I think they each have their. Um, I liked fourth grade probably the most, and and I I liked the kids who had had developed a sense of humor and um, you know you could actually uh, joke with them and 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 when they're in second grade they kind of look at you. <laughs> No, I, I love second graders, but I do like my fourth graders. Yeah, yeah but then they know the drill too, I guess. Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. So how long were you a reading at instructor? Um, I was a reading specialist for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you retired from that. Uh, um, and, and I taught also at Union. After I went back, I went to Union, and then I, at the, my last uh, five, five years were in Bixby. Well, Union is just like a university itself, and it's mm -hmm. so big. Mm -hmm. or at least the, the gym's big. That's the only part I've been in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's big. So you went elementary school, then reading specialist, and while you were teaching at Union, was was it English? When or I was still reading, it was reading. reading. I did. Um, I was elementary, and then I went in. I did. As a reading specialist, my principal came to me and asked me because he knew I'd gotten. When I went back to get my uh, certification, I just went ahead and and did. I think I had to have twelve hours, so I went ahead and just did the you know the masters. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then you were retired what year? Officially retired. Okay. What year? Um, <laughs> it would have been uh, eleven years ago. So. Oh, six? 2006, yeah. Tough decision to, to quit? Um, I had other things I wanted to do, and um, I... Um, the politics, politics were getting crazy at that point in time. 
We work for several different systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that from the time we started until the time we quit, things had changed some during the, in the school system itself. How they, how they did things, and mm -hmm. I guess computers were mm -hmm. in by then too. Mm -hmm. You were there when that was transition mm -hmm. was going. Oh, on. I went through um, integration, okay, um, in Oklahoma City, and then when I moved over here, they had not integrated, and I actually taught in an all black school a couple of years and loved that. And I had um, I always say my claim to fame is Spencer Tillman. If you know who he is, he's an announcer, he's a sports announcer. <laughs> and that was the year I taught speech to get into uh, t uh, Tulsa schools. The principal hired me as a speech pr a teacher, which I had no experience in, but um, I loved the mime and the, the performing part of it, so we did a lot of performing. So. So then he is Spencer Tillman. Mm -hmm. I have to go back. Yeah, to you know. He's a pretty incredible young, oh well, he's probably now, I know he's somewhere in his 40s, so, or maybe even close to 50. Well, with integration in Oklahoma City, was it a, a challenging time, or go no, pretty smoothly? It went smoothly, because they basically they bust, and they bust, um, 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 from, they bust across lines, but they I don't think they bust all, no, they did age groups, so, but it went, it went well, it went. They they just did it and it happened, and it, it was no biggie. Okay. And then when Tulsa was similar? Tulsa never really did go through an integration program, and theirs was, so, no. Hmm. Wonderful. You'll have to look that up and yeah, find everything. Mm -hmm. unless, you, unless you want to explain why that is, I don't know. Well, I think they felt their schools were, they tried to make the schools on all areas of town equal. Already, okay. Uh huh. So. But yet you taught it in all, all blacks. Mm hmm. And it didn't integrate? Um, if, if it, the only way it was going to integrate would be that. Um, people moved into the neighborhood, and that's basically been the whole, except I know what they've done too, they've also done the magnet schools. That was their integration. Okay. I hadn't thought about that, but that's how they integrated. That would make sense too. Yeah. yeah. Well, this area has just grown and grown, and mm -hmm. had it broken mm -hmm. down, and mm -hmm. jinx, from yeah. what I understand. It's mm -hmm. And th this, is, this is Bixby schools, and Bixby schools has, have really, really just exploded. Mm -hmm. Oh, a lot, a lot. It's kind of like the bedroom communities of Tulsa, I guess, people mm -hmm. living further out and mm -hmm. interstates have mm -hmm. brought people in to work faster, too. So you've had an interesting, interesting career then. <laughs> so that gets me into, I had read that you were using butterflies in your classrooms, but if you were teaching English, you would Oh, I did. Them. I used them in my classroom. And when I, now, I wasn't te when I was in elementary, I taught all subjects. Okay. And were you using them back in, in, oh, in those days? Too? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember the first. Well, the story of the butterfly is that when um, we moved and when we moved to this place, there was um, a vine growing on the uh, fence, and my kids were two and well, eighteen. Well, when we moved, we were eighteen months and four, and. Um, it was right the summer that they turned two and five, and we found a caterpillar on a vine. And so we brought it in, and we put it in a canning jar, because I used to can, and garden, and uh, we raised it, and it turned into a monarch butterfly. And I always tell people back then, we didn't really, unless you had a butterfly book uh, or an encyclopedia, you didn't have the internet to go to to find out what you had. So... Um, well, how did you know how to take care of it when you brought it in? All I, just instinct, I guess, because I took it in and brought it in on the vine it was on and um, fed it the vine that it was on. And luckily, it was on, it was eating when I found it. It had hadn't moved because uh, they move when they pupate, of course, or sometimes they'll move off the vine when they're um, going through their um, different um, oh, um, stages 
of growth. Um, and so uh, they, they molt five times monarchs do. So when they molt, they'll, they'll leave the, the plant sometimes. But fortunately, we found another plant. And that's probably more we can. No, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, have a reason. Uh, no, well, it just happened that we were lucky. Well, and the vine wasn't a milkweed? It was. I had no idea what the vine was at that point. Yeah, in time. Well, I just knew it was a vine. I didn't know milkweed was a vine. That's why. I, I, I'll show you one. Just I figured it was a stock out in the middle of the field. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's neat. Their kids were very, very interested in watching it. Uh huh. The they transition. Were, uh -huh. But I was the one that probably influenced the most. And that changed from that point on. You had something to do with yeah. monarchs. Well, and well, they would show up every year on that vine. Oh, that's only vine. Uh -huh. And then the next year, I found a caterpillar on parsley, thinking it was a monarch. I raised it, and it turned out to be a black swallowtail. So I was really intrigued, thinking, okay, so if you plant different plants, then you can raise different butterflies. Your your curiosity and your mm -hmm. scientific mind came. Yeah. Right. Cool. Mm -hmm. And kids in the classroom, it was it real. They really, um, it was something that really reached them. And a lot of times, it reached kids that might not, that you might not reach some other way. So you had to go get a book on, on butterflies. Yeah, so. the little golden book. I found that, and I think I used the. Uh, of course, our uh, the encyclopedias that everybody had back there. The uh, the blue ones. Um, Oh, what was the education educator ones? Uh, I think at Britannica, but that's no, not right. World, and that was World, World Book. World Book encyclopedias, World. right? Yeah. So uh, I remember the picture with all the butterflies on it, the illustration. But there wasn't a whole lot of information uh, available, and the Golden Book did give you pictures of caterpillars and butterflies. And I'm not for sure what year that little book came out. It's, I've still got it. It's just a little paperback. You know, yeah. Yeah. So big. And were you still using canning jars to do? Me? To no. You were, when you were raising them? Um, no, I, used, I went to plastic things and, the, and maybe, or uh, just, I've used everything to raise butterflies over the years. Um, I have raised some in canning jars. We raised moths in canning jars in school. I remember, we raised everything. The kids would bring in, whatever the kids would find, we would stick it in a jar and feed it, and I would always tell them, bring you know, if you find it on something, bring whatever you find it on. If they didn't, I'd try to research, and then we would um, raise them. Cool. And, uh, you yeah, know, we had moss hatch out, and we had um, butterflies, and black swallowtails in particular, and monarchs every year. Take them out and release them. Uh-huh. That was a yeah. fun time for the... Well, I don't know, would they get sad because they flew away and didn't come back? No. Uh -uh. They understood uh -uh. that that was just... No, they, they, they understood it. Uh, yeah, I remember one little autistic boy, which this was toward the end of my career, who was so fascinated with him. He would sneak out of his classroom, and he was right next door, and, and she always knew where he was to come in and watch them and look at them. And, and then when we would release them, he would just stand in awe. Totally. You just never know what's going yeah. to trigger that interest. Mm -hmm. Wow. And they're quiet, I guess. That's another. You can have them in the classroom. They don't make much noise. And you teach, you teach kids responsibility by knowing they have to keep them clean. and We have to collect fresh food and things like that. Mm -hmm. So would they bring you food from home, or would you actually go out and look around the playground? Um, most of the time, if they brought something in, I'd have them bring stuff from home. If I brought it in, I would usually end up having to, uh, you know, bringing in the food. But I'd have them help me with the cleaning and and responsibility. Was it natural food, or did you have to make some? I do not. No, it was it. all natural. Mm -hmm. So you grew milkweed at your house. That vine was the only thing I knew of, and there was times I would actually drive the streets looking for that vine when we had caterpillars we were raising in a classroom and I was running out. And I found, I would find it, I learned that it would grow in a lot of, where it would grow and I would go out and look for it and I'd bring it in. And, uh, yeah. It all under that other duty says that something. It did. I learned a lot. It was, you know, all hands-on. <laughs> 
and leave brown duck alone at home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Try not to, mm -hmm. to kill it when you need it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And did uh, so about over the course. I don't know how if you want to over the course of your using them in your classroom. Any idea how many you might have raised? Oh, thousands. And then I bring them in and. It, and other teachers would want to raise them in their classes, so I furnish them. But I would, the only thing that would be, I would find that, that it would be my responsibility for, to feed those and everything and take care of them and stuff. But anyway, yeah, so there were times that uh, it was a big, it was a big enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it, but it's a pretty one in the end, too, when mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. And I've read people now are using them to, or there's butterfly farms. Mm hmm where people are buy them and use them for weddings and funerals mm -hmm. and stuff. And I'm not and I'm not keen on all that. Yeah. Okay. I just want to ask your opinion. No, on I'm that. not I'm not even keen. I'm I'm not keen on um, any of that. I have uh, just some misgivings about it. But I mean, you know, everybody has their need to support themselves and and and, and everything. So but yeah, to me butterflies need to be free. And if we bring them in and raise them, um, I don't want to be um, I don't want to be breeding them and uh, selling them and things like that. So it's just my. It's not the economical aspect you're interested in. No, no, it's the, no, no. It's the nature. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I did. One, there was a time when I purchased them because I didn't have them around, but I found that they were never as healthy as the ones. They were always smaller and never as healthy as the ones that I would find in on plants. And that if I provided the plants and the the adults found them, that those were normally a lot healthier and stronger. And um, how would you judge that? How would I judge that? Yeah. Well, size-wise, for one thing, like I remember ordering monarchs, and they never, the size was always small when I released them. If I paid for the ones, mm -hmm. and in every butterfly that I ever purchased, and, and as I did, as I said, I did, I did do that for a while because if they didn't show up, then I want, I was, I, I had, I needed a butterfly fix, and so um, I just, um, it was just the comparison. And, um, and a lot of times, they, a lot of them wouldn't make it. They would die during the process of uh, being raised. So you, you realize that if you purchase some from um, Florida, and that's where most of, a lot of them come from, they've traveled quite a way, so they've got some stress before they ever get to you. And, yeah. and that, their lifespans, how about that? It's, it's not, short. It's short. Mm -hmm. it's like in, Monarchs are about nine. And some of the others are maybe a couple of weeks. Okay. And I've raised over 30 species of butterflies from plants that are either, I've either encountered them out in the wild and, and not really that much. Most of the time it's been from my backyard. And flowers around. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So you, you're interested in watching them just from a very, very I guess they're not eggs. Yeah, they're eggs. Mm -hmm. They're eggs. Mm -hmm. All the way through the whole process. And how do you explain to the children, or do you, if one doesn't make it? If um, it's just part of the. It's just process. part of life, and and then, yeah. And the healthiest and fittest are going to make it. And sometimes the ones that are weak aren't, and, and you want the, the healthy ones to uh, be able to, those are the ones that are going to make more. Do you have any idea, or have any of your students come back and said, I'm using them in my classroom now? No, I haven't heard that. Uh, and um, they um, they remember me with the butterflies and like, they. Uh, the few that I'm on Facebook with have, if they find a butterfly, they always want to know what if they want to know what it is or something like that. But not too many of them have it, that I know of. Yeah, and it may, it may, they may, and I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in your earliest memory, uh, where, where did monarchs show up? Um, and I know they did in your backyard when your children were young, but prior to that, like in your youth, did you have any? 
I don't remember, remember Monarchs in remember. Oklahoma City. I do remember my parent, my grandparents had a ranch in Edmond, or between Edmond and Guthrie. And I remember um, we had to have a butterfly collection at one, or an insect collection, and I collected some butterflies, and I remember I collected them at their house. But I, did, but I don't have, and I thought about that, I thought about, because uh, some people say, well, I remember them from when I was a child. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. And I don't know that, um, I think Northeast Oklahoma sees more monarchs coming through than Oklahoma City does. Um, you would think, you would hear the, talking about I-35 being the butterfly byway. The butterfly, uh, yeah, the butterfly highway. The uh, highway. That's what, that's, and that's Dr. Chip Taylor. Yeah. So the Northeast would be a little bit over, but then that gets you into the Tallgrass Prairie, where it's mm -hmm. Northeast too, so maybe, maybe right. Although I've had one person t that was in Duncan, in that area, and they remember just swarms coming through mm -hmm. when they were migrating. Mm -hmm. Only one person, you know. Mm -hmm. So and I'm not sure how well their memory is, could just be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I grew up on Anchorage, so we had, but I know we didn't have milkweed or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember milkweed being planted um, anywhere in proximity. And there's milkweed around here that grows wild. Okay. Well, and farmers aren't too fond of having caterpillars around eating their plants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your grandfather might not have. Mm -hmm. um, so was was that for like 4-H or, or? Just just the classroom. Class. I think about fifth grade. I did it maybe for science or something. Did you have to preserve them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... yeah we had to pin them and all that stuff. <laughs> we don't want to think about that. I know it's a teaching process, but still. Most of the people that have an interest in it, though, probably did that at some point in, in time. So, you know, they would, and they would go back and say that that's what started them. Well, how do you tell a, a male from a female? A monarch? Mm -hmm. um, there's um, a monarch, the male is brighter, the veins are narrower, and there are two black spots on the hind wings. They're actually um, glands that um, you can tell it's a male. And then the female is more, uh, she's not as bright, she has thicker veins, and so she has more black and maybe a, more of a rusty color usually. And then she doesn't have, her hind wings don't have the glands. So. so if you didn't have them side by side, how would you know if their veins were wide or not? But it, it, someone has seen them a lot. I yeah, and, it, and it's fairly obvious, especially, you know, I think everybody pretty much goes by the, the glands because you can see them on both sides of the wings. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the males only, or the only ones that have the dots. Mm -hmm, the little okay. spots on the wings. Uh -huh. There's a little, it's a little black spot on that vein. It's just a little thick area on that vein where you can see it. I was looking around, you don't collect too many butterflies. So we've got one butterfly pot over there. Oh, well, listen, if you went through my house, <laughs> I have, I've told people, you don't have to give me butterfly stuff. <laughs> well, but, mm -hmm. How did you get known as the butterfly lady? Oh, I don't know. Um, it's a good question. I I I think um, I did the first series butterfly gardening probably um, about twenty or so years ago wow. when I planted my wow. first milkweed plants, and so until that time it was just mainly you know vines that I was collecting the monarchs off it and everything. As long as we lived at that house where we lived, that was what I was using. And then, um, um, I got involved with a group on, well, after I retired, um, that's when I really got into the gardening and stuff like that. So, uh, and that's not been a long time. No. No. And then I start, um, I had, um, start, I spoke, Oxley, uh, started, you know, people started asking me to talk, and then, um, 
I don't know, it just sort of happened. It just, you know, and, um, and then people, I, I shared um, eggs or caterpillars with teachers in schools, some place, different places. Um, that made, that was a big thing. Um, I worked, um, after retirement, I um, sold native plants for, at, at the farmer's market in Broken Arrow, which didn't last very long, because uh, my mom had Alzheimer's and it got, and she got to the point where I had to devote most, you know, my time to taking care of her. Mm -hmm. And but I did that for a while, and I think that might have been a, a big point where it really took off. Is when I sold milkweeds, and I would actually raise the monarchs and take and put them in paper sacks when they were getting ready to pupate, and then they pupate on the edges, and I would give those to kids. So they could take them home and watch them be close. Well, that that sort of what did it then? Probably yeah. just yeah. that, and, yeah. uh, and then groups started asking me to speak and stuff. And people will say, "There's a bunch of monarch ladies around." In fact, I've had so. But anyway, can't have too many. No, can't have too many. Uh -huh. uh, native plants. That's the other piece of this puzzle too. I've got to get into. I mean, mm -hmm. besides having the milkweed for them to. Mm -hmm. They need nectar mm -hmm. to, to survive on, so mm -hmm. we have to figure that out next. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you moved to, do you, you know, you have a uh, Marnock Way Station mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. What does that entail? Well, actually, um, I think um, I joined a group on, on, okay, computer opened the whole new world, of course. And when that, you know, that happened. And then I joined a group called Garden Forum, uh, Garden, Garden Web, and on computer, um, on the internet, and there were a bunch of butterfly-crazy people like me. And so when we did that, I did that, I started learning a lot of stuff from other people. And um, I really hadn't encountered anybody here locally at that point in time. Um, and then I started doing butterfly counts here locally, and then I ran into some people, like there's a guy named Jim Thayer, who uh, is a master gardener, and he's almost 80, maybe close, and he did, he's done a lot with butterflies. Um, Dr. J Dr. Nelson, who um, was at ORU, is responsible for our database on butterflies here in the state of Oklahoma and the moss. He, um, he started that and he taught in biology and he's retired and he's, he's in his, I think he's in his 80s. And then he had a friend named uh, John, it was John, Dr. John Nelson and then John Fisher who became his um, kind of um, Dr. Nelson mentored him, and so he has taken over that and, and kept it. And I got I got involved with all these people, and then I started I did butterfly counts at Oxley. That's probably the first my first uh, foray at Oxley was going out to on a butterfly day, and Jim Thayer used to do those, and um, I learned more about different kinds and everything, but I was still doing the monarchs, and then. Like I said, I started planting real mil milkweed, or not real milkweed, but milkweed plants, the incarnata or the swamp milkweed, which is really pretty. And that was my first um, going into actually intentionally planting milkweed. And then I started getting more monarchs and stuff. But then I started getting all kinds of butterflies because I, I thought, I found out if you plant this, this butterfly will show up. If you plant this, this butterfly will show up. And so that's... And I love that. I just, and some of that was done before I retired. Mm -hmm. uh, the the butterfly garden was started before I retired. The one it was not this house; it was the other house. So getting to Monarch Way Stations when we moved in here, um, I learned about the Monarch Way Station program. It started in two thousand and five. The Monarch Watch, okay. uh, and I had right before I retired, and then in two thousand and seven, I. And became I got my garden all planted out here in the backyard. We built this house, and then we and I did the garden, 
and that's when I applied and I'm number 1524. Now it's up now probably about 17,000. So um, all across the country or all across just, the U.S. Not just Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. okay. Not just Oklahoma. Yeah. And um, but yeah, that that in particular becoming um, kind of affiliated with Monarch Watch. Well, do you, does the garden have to be so big for you to qualify to be on the? Hundred square feet, is all. Oh, well. So it doesn't have to be very big. Ten by ten. You just have to have. At that point in time, it was three different kinds of milkweeds and then the nectar plants to encourage them so that when they come through in the migration. And at that point in time, um, Oklahoma was looked at as a place where they migrated through in the fall. And they really didn't even know that they really came that much. The, the consensus was that all the butterflies migrated from Mexico up into Texas. They laid their eggs and then they skipped Oklahoma and they went to the north and then that's where they spent all their time building the population. And then in the fall, because there were uh, records of roost in Oklahoma, like your Duncan one and roost on this side of the town, of, of um, town and um, I remember some incredible migrations, haven't seen one like that, but when I was teaching I can remember some monarchs. I remember a couple of years where the monarchs were so thick that they were just, the air was full of them. Mm -hmm. And so we were on that uh, migration going back to Mexico. And um, so that you want to plant the plants to support that migration, the nectar plants. Mm -hmm. So now Oklahoma's not just a fly-through state. <laughs> no, and it, it's really it's been, Dr. Baum is doing incredible things with that. But I've been saying for years and years that we're not in a fly-through state because there's a person here right now in Haskell, Oklahoma, who has monarch, she's raising caterpillars that were laid this summer on her plants. I've had monarchs flying through. I just haven't had that female come in and lay eggs. I had two females a few days ago and yesterday there was a male out in the yard and so I see them during the summer normally I find I have I will have a population in the summer this year I haven't it's yeah. been really strange but I had like I said I had over 300 eggs laid early this year because we really were important to the migration northward and we really opened eyes because like uh, Jane Breckenridge and her, and I know people, okay, uh, what happened at her place, uh, other things, you know, where people just saw lots and lots of monarchs, and a lot of monarchs laid eggs across Oklahoma, and they were raised. Mm. And a lot of this I know now, too, because I do two Facebook groups, I do um, uh, Oklahoma Friends of Monarchs, and so it's people across Oklahoma, and so I, I actually encourage people to report what they see to Journey North. Journey North has um, been around for a long time. It's another, it's all about all kinds of migrations. It's, it was uh, designed for education purposes, for classroom. And uh, I don't remember what time, I'm, at what point in, I became involved with them and providing data. And then, yeah. So I've been fascinated with um, monarchs in Oklahoma and the role Oklahoma plays. So they don't typically, they typically come through going north by April? Yes, late March, April. Okay. April 1st this year was the first, my first eggs in the backyard. So you go out and check every day? Um, Every other day? No, I just actually, uh, a lot of times I'll be outside and it always seems to be uh, probably ironic that I'll be out there and I see the monarch. <laughs> just meant to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they fly back in September, October? Um, or? We'll start, we should start seeing quite a few starting to build up in August and then August, August cool. all the way through until October and then October of course when the migration comes through we usually have a pretty good population in Oklahoma but when the migration comes through then they join they join the migration okay and you say and they're, but they were actually uh, from eggs 
Dr. Baum raises will raise a lot and and she, she tags she tags her or something she does she and and her tagging has been incredible as far as showing that monarchs from Oklahoma make it to Mexico because that was another piece of the puzzle do our monarchs from this area make it to uh, Mexico? Well, when you say you count them, what does that? It how do you do that? When you say you go on a monarch count, oh, or butterfly, butterfly count. count butterfly oh, we, count. when we do butterfly counts, is we go out into like last week we went to um, Nickel J T Nickel Preserve over near Tahlequah. It's a, a nature conservancy. So nature conservancy in Oklahoma has quite a few really nice properties like the tall grass prairie and, and everything, and they do a butterfly count on those different properties just to see what the population is and basically what you're doing is you're um, documenting species and how many of that species is present and it's just on one day and you just go out with a bunch of people and you look for butterflies. You sit, well, I mean you divide this area into, mm -hmm. you, you check this section, I'll mm -hmm. check that side. Mm -hmm. You have to know what your butterflies are then. Yeah, the people learn a lot when they do that because if they can spot a butterfly, then somebody in the group can say, "Oh, that's an American lady," or "That's a buckeye," or "That's that," and then and and that's what I did is I learned a lot about butterflies when I started doing that. Take photographs. Mm -hmm. do you, do you, mm -hmm. you just have a tally sheet, or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you have a tally sheet. We take photos so that we can make sure have somebody look at it if there's a question. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you're not counting the same one each. No, and usually we move from one area to another, and so uh, because you're moving, there's uh, you don't ever go back over the one the area where you were. You just keep moving. So checking for eggs too, or just the butterfly itself. Um, if you've got um, host plants, you might check for eggs, or you might check for caterpillars. But you're usually looking for adults. Have you seen any that you didn't expect to see, like new, new ones for you recently? Um, last year was an amazing year because we had the southern butterflies come up through here. Um, we just, the count we did last week was pretty much, um, we didn't really see anything new. The one at, uh, at uh, JT Nickel. Well, how many did you count that day? We had 43 species. I'm not for sure what the total number was of the butterflies, but we were we report the species. That's what we'll report. Is that a good number? Or a, that was a pretty good number, four? actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see little yellow ones a lot lately. Just little, little yellow ones. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what they are, but they're around my house. Are they kind of orangey yellow? No, yellow yellow. They're as bright as yellow as you can get. Okay. Could be sleepy oranges. Mm -hmm. That's a that's sweet name. <laughs> yeah, there's sleepy oranges and then there's a little yellow that's a yellow butterfly. That's a pay more attention. I'm getting more interested in mm -hmm. it too. Mm -hmm. as, as we go along with this. <laughs> and then, the, so how often do you do the butterfly counts? Um, there's usually around July 4th, there's a butterfly count, Oxley counts. Um, I'm thinking they may count three times a year there. Why July 4th? I mean, is that the middle of the Well, they just do it all. That's pretty much a national mm -hmm. one all over the U.S. So it's NASA, North American. It's consistency. Mm -hmm. North American Butterfly Association that sponsors that one, and then all the data is turned into them. Do they have a, a conference that you all go to? I haven't. Uh, mm -hmm. No. There are conferences. The LIP. The Lepidoptera Society um, has conferences every year. Um, I think NABA might, but NABA has a big butterfly center down in um, Mission, Texas, mm -hmm. and they have a huge, huge garden, and they have butterflies that are amazing that come across the border, and then, yeah, Thank butterflies you won't see anywhere else. Have you visited? Yes, I have. Have you been to Mexico to the... No, not um, not to visit. I went wearing ground. I wanted to. I was going to go this year, and I was and I got sick. And you wonder what that would be like. I mean, you probably have to. Oh yeah. You probably have to hike way out in order to get to see. My friend that was going with me went ahead and went, and she 
came back and brought lots of amazing photos of it. And she'd go again? I mean, she'd enjoy it enough I think to go she again? Would. Yeah, I think she would. Mm -hmm. It'd be cool to see, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the man at the Tongress Prairies explained to his favorite time when they're coming through is in the, get there early enough in the morning when the dew's still on their wings and they the, they flutter and the mist goes up and it's just that, oh, that, that picture mm -hmm. just you know, I can imagine what that mm -hmm. looks like to see that happen. So I'd like to time it and go see that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you've probably got similar. I've never had one see. like that. Uh, uh, where I know I've had caterpillars with drops of water on them and everything. But um, haven't really seen a dew-kissed butterfly. We'd love to see that. You said it's amazing. So mm -hmm. well, I've heard very few people probably get to see that. Mm -hmm. but. I can hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does your, is your husband interested in them too? Not no. really. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, a garden's not help hurting anything. It makes the house pretty, so mm -hmm. no reason mm -hmm. not to have mm -hmm. one. No. He doesn't go on counts with you. He's been on maybe a couple of them, but. Uh, did your children get interested in them to go beyond? No. Uh, go beyond. No, my son and his wife. Are they've planted a butterfly garden? So, and it's my my daughter in law is pretty more interested, I think. Yeah, well, that's what that whole concept. I mean, why I guess why I should ask you this to explain why is it important that Oklahoma take care of the monarchs? Um, in the big picture, you know, the big picture of things, I think it's something we don't want to lose. Um, it's an iconic butterfly, is this in um. It represents the, all the pollinators, for one thing, and um, the migration, I think, is it's more the migration that there's the, the um, concern about losing that migration because it's an amazing migration. Is it the only butterfly that, well... There are other butterflies that migrate, but no other butterfly migrates the distance that the monarch does, and, it, and it's a tri-national uh, migration, you know, from Mexico to the U.S. to Canada, so... There's no other butterfly that uh, migrates through three nations. That's a long distance. Not the same butterfly doesn't make it. No, no, it doesn't. It's it's um, it is um, four to five generations. The gen the probably the migration north is maybe two to three generations, and then the migration back is four is the fourth and fifth. Now the fifth generation is the generation that has been that they're just now recognizing, and that's one of, that's the generation that we have here in Oklahoma. Yeah, that's that late summer generation. So a generation they they get so far, lay their eggs, and then that that bunch goes the next leg mm -hmm. of the trip. And about how long would it? Well, you didn't have any idea how long it would take them to get from Mexico back to. Canada? Um, Six months, probably. No, uh -uh. I was trying to think when um, a lot of your questions could be answered through Journey North because it's uh, what they do is they have maps on there and they have, uh, we report our sightings and everything. And so they will actually on their map, they will show everybody sightings and then they color code it so you can see, okay, this first way got here. And then they went up here and then on up to there. And I think probably by, I'm trying to remember, I think even the end of May, there were some that were in the northern states. I know they've been sighted in, in Ottawa now. And um, the migration this year, the northern migration has been better, more, uh, more butterflies have made it than in a long time. So it's been a, uh, quite a migration. I wonder if we had any major storms that are less, less storms, I guess, mm -hmm. for them to have to deal with going. There was concern that they were going so rapidly to the north that, uh, they were going to get there and not find food. But then we had the big storm that slowed them down here. And we had all the northern um, fronts that were just that just kind of pushed them back here in Oklahoma. And um, 
So we had a huge spring population. And then those, when the southerly winds came back, they went ahead and moved on. And, and they're at the mercy of the weather, the weather and, and winds. So by a large population, how many, what are you thinking? Oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I don't know either. Mm -hmm. Large, in, in comparison to years past, so it was mm -hmm. more considerable. Um, last year, I was trying to think the numbers. I've got all that. Uh, I do a presentation. I've got it all in the presentation. I'm trying to think about eight. Was it eight million? Eight, no, it's acres. Eight acres of butter of monarchs. Now the high, the all-time high was about thirty-nine acres, mm -hmm. and then from that. we had thirteen acres the year before this in twenty fifteen, and actually this year was twenty sixteen population, and then. Um, in 2015, that was the migrating population. Then they had the cold spell in Mexico with the freezing rain that killed a lot of butterflies mm -hmm. as they were just getting ready to migrate north. So they were really, really, really concerned about the population, but it rebounded more than they thought it would. And so I think it was eight acres. They would like to get it back I'm not for sure what the number is. Maybe 16 acres is what they'd like to see it get up to. So you're halfway there. Yeah. So they need to plant more milkweed and more nectar plants. Mm -hmm. Native. Well, not necessarily native, just mm -hmm. nectar. Mm -hmm. So the average Oklahoman should do what? Well, the average Oklahoman can plant milkweed. They can even have it, if they don't have a big place, they can put it in a pot. On the front porch. Uh, on the front porch or the back porch or uh, yeah, on a patio or someplace. Uh, they find my milkweed that's in pots. Even, you know, they'll, they'll lay eggs on all of it. What's in the garden and what's on the patio. It doesn't necessarily need to be blooming then for them to lay the eggs. Mm -hmm. They just need the greenery, greenery part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the plant. Mm -hmm. I'll, have to, I'll have to work on that. I don't have any... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, going forward, what do you envision like the next five years to be for for all of this? Well, Chip Taylor of Monarch Watch, his vision is to see uh, the milkweed planted all the way up high, the the corridor, mm -hmm. the thirty five corridor. What I'd like to see is I would like to see milkweed planted along Route sixty six corridor and possibly forty four across the state because uh, it's not just limited to uh, central Oklahoma. And um, a friend and I, we went out, it was, it's been, I think it's two years ago now, I'm pretty sure it was. And we went along Route 66 and found there's the virus which grows wild in Oklahoma, that's the milkweed. We found all kinds of caterpillars and stuff up all the way from like, uh, I think we started at Viridis and went up to Claremore. And uh, it's obvious that uh, there's, you know, considerable uh, migration through northeast Oklahoma. And then Stillwater, of course, is still, it's on that edge. And um, so I would like to see, you know, if we're going to, it, yeah. And then uh, I think I'd like, I think what Dr. Baum's doing, and it's probably past it for me, it would be to document where there is milkweed growing in Oklahoma. And she's done a lot of the documentation of that. You have to cite it as you're driving down the road. You thought, oh, there's something. Uh, and, I, and I did. I went to, um, I went up um, um, 69, all the way to Lawrence, Kansas, Highway 69, and when we came back, we found starting in Cherryville, I think it was about Cherryvale, Kansas, all the way down through um, I think Collinsville, no, north the north edge of Owasso, we found Viridis growing, and I I sent the report back to Monarch 
want because uh, that's a, that was a lot of milkweed. And then I went up in around Bartlesville on Highway 75. We went up to Kansas on 75. So everywhere I go, I'm I'm uh, yeah, my antenna are up to find milkweed, just like a monarch. <laughs> <laughs> Well, is it the only butterfly that lays their eggs on it? No, the other ones will too. Mm -hmm. uh, queens, and we see queens in northeast Oklahoma, and I've had queens in my backyard and, and raised them every, uh, most every year. I had some earlier in this year and raised them, and they're really pr a beautiful butterfly. And then last year, we actually had a soldier, which is the third species in the U.S. There's only three Danids, D-A-N-A-I-D-S. Um, there's um, Plexippus, which is the monarch, um, Gallipus, which is the queen, and Erisimus, which is the soldier. Those are the three dads. And, um, but yes, and, and a soldier made it all the way up here, which was the first sighting of a soldier in Oklahoma, but it made it all the way, one of them made it all the way up to the Flycatcher Trails Garden in Jinx. Oh. From where? South Texas. South Texas. Yes, normally that's where they're found in South Texas. What color are they? They're the same. They look just like a queen. They're all orange and black. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're all OSU colors. Mm -hmm. I to, is it bigger, smaller? About the same size. You'll have to look at some photos. Um, and tell the uh, difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do have a website. It's uh, a P-based site, and for, I'm not for sure how many years I've been putting photos on that of butterflies, and if you Google Sandy Schwinn, it'll take you to it, and I have um, the um, life cycle pictures of the butterflies I've raised, and then um, I have photos from all the different families of butterflies that, as many as possible, as I, been able to photograph. Then I also have Lao butterflies and some Thai butterflies and some African butterflies. So, because when I go around the world, if I get to go out in places, I photograph butterflies. Well, tools of the trade would be camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A cell phone or, yeah, a, good, or a good yeah. camera. Yeah. Have camera, we'll try that. Uh -huh. right. <laughs> well, when you say you raise them, do you bring them in or you just watch them out? I bring them in. Bring them in. Uh -huh. um, because there's a lot of predators. Now, I don't bring everything in. There's butterflies I leave out uh, because I know they'll make it, but uh, a lot of them won't make it. So, and, and it's, you know, a lot of people just, they don't bring th them in, they leave them outside and, um, I just, uh, I've always enjoyed the process, and... So about predators, birds, mainly? Um, okay, praying mantis. Ah. Um, dragonflies, and I have, a, a, I have a garden full of dragonflies this year. Birds, and I have lots of birds. I, I have a big predator uh, population out there, so uh, that's probably one reason to bring mm -hmm. them in. Wasps. Wasp will actually sting them and then uh, eat them. The caterpillars in particular. Um, yeah, there's there's uh, normally in the uh, it's three two to three monarchs per hundred eggs make it to out in the wild make it to adult oh. or butterfly. That's not that's not a high percentage. No, and if they can't find if they don't find a lot of milkweed and lay a lot of eggs, then yeah. I had never thought about uh, dragonflies or mm -hmm. praying mantis, mm -hmm. but again, I mean, that's the life cycle of everything else too, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another reason. And lizards and toads. That's mm -hmm. teaching teaching material too. Mm -hmm. you know, about those mm -hmm. type of things mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So you're driving up 66 and you're pulling off, <laughs> not to take a picture of scenery, but to take a to take account of. Look up under the leaf. Yeah, we were actually, it was hilarious when uh, Kelly and I did it. She's out, she's one of the naturals at Oxley. And she was just getting into it. And I like to mentor people, and I have mentored a lot of people. So we were just checking, and uh, she had just probably, I don't know if she'd ever found her first, had found caterpillars before, but she was just taken by it. So we were just basically, and we found a queen even. 
when we did it, but yeah. Mm-hmm. So we were walking the median and probably, you know, people coming by seeing us <laughs> wonder what on earth are those women doing out there bent over? <laughs> they throw their keys out and can't find them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like to ask that question, me tools of the trade. So your camera, something to keep records. When you're doing a count. To do mm-hmm. a count. Uh, sunscreen, of course, and a, probably a hat. Yeah, and if you're out maybe collecting, you might want a container to put them in. A container, yeah. Mm-hmm. And probably shears or something to break. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or, I mean, it, mm-hmm. does milkweed break pretty easily, or do you need something? You probably, to you need, um, when I go out, because I do go, I have to, I had to, um, I had to, um, I didn't have enough milkweed for all the eggs I had this spring, so I had to go out and collect milkweed in the wild and I'm thankful that I know where there's some fields that I can go collect it and I, I bring pruning shears with me to cut it. And gloves or is it? Sticky? And gloves because the latex is really, yes. It's sticky. I'm, it's I'm, really sticky. I envision it being sticky. It is very sticky, yeah. So, so gloves you... and then I bring a bucket with a small amount of water in the bottom so I can take those stems and stick them down in that. And it's better if, if the bucket's tall enough so most of all the plants are inside that bucket with just the water on the bottom because it, it keeps them from drying out. And if they, if they have eggs on them, you bring them to anyway? Um, it depends. I like, if I've got a lot of eggs and I'm raising them, I don't want to add to it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> And they, they don't worry about trespassing? Um, we have, if, um, there are places that I know are okay. I don't go to places that say no trespassing. I would ask permission. And what, do you wear boots? I actually wear, um, I, I have insect guard clothing that I wear because the ticks are bad and I've been bit, I have had too many tick bites and dealt with um, a diagnosis of limes, which I caught early, but anyway. Um, and so I bought, I purchased insect guard clothing, which is treated for 70 washings. So when I go out on a butterfly count or something, I wear that. I spray my shoes and my socks with permethrin. And then um, I wear elastic bands around my ankles to tuck my pants in so that Ticks and sugars cannot get up, you know, on the skin, because I don't treat the skin unless it's on my arms or someplace where it's exposed. And then long sleeves. And long sleeves, yes. Wow, well, you have it takes, it takes some preparation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. And and you've got your water you got to bring, and because you're out and it's hot. Mm-hmm. I was worried more about snakes in the fields that you go to, but I you know ticks are. And chiggers no, are I'm not running into any snakes. But yeah, I do have some boots I can wear. Mm-hmm. So about how often do you have to do that? I mean, a couple of times a year you want out to well, do this? When we were getting milkweed, when I was getting milkweed this uh, spring, I was going and getting it at least once a week, maybe twice. Mm-hmm. And how are you raising them now? Do you still have... Do you have aquariums? Oh, I have or? plenty of milkweed out here. And then, uh, oh, I can show you. you bring them in. I, I do um, um, campers with zippers on them from Walmart are good raising containers. Mm-hmm. I do uh, tomato cages that I use, um, uh, paint strainers over them. And I have one of those set up right now. I can show that to you. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I'm pretty, I'm, I may use, if I have a small amount, I'll use a plastic storage container and then I'll make a hole in the top and then possibly put a paper towel or something over it so that they can attach to that and then I can, it's easy to clean up and stuff, but that's air, um, uh, just whatever. Well, when you say clean up, what do you have to clean? Oh my goodness. Uh, um, Butterfly ranching or farming, whatever you want to call it, is like you got to muck out containers. <laughs> Just like you know, when you have horses, yeah. uh, they produce a lot of fr- butterflies produce a lot of frass or poop. <laughs> Kids love that in the classroom when you're teaching them about that, and they have to, that's the big thing about teaching them. I have to clean out 
you know. The so. caterpillars or the butterflies? I mean, caterpillars themselves. I don't remember seeing that in my cup. But I would have known what Okay, little, little dark, dark. little dark pellets. Very small. I wasn't sure what that was. Uh huh. That's the uh, that's the waste product. Uh huh. And they do whatever goes in. I've told. I remember telling kids, whatever anything takes in has to come back out. <laughs> and we call it frass butterflies. Spell F R A S S. Like rhymes with grass. Uh huh. Well, the other thing I noticed on the bottom of the cup was once. I don't know when it showed up. It was kind of a pinky, rosy, rosy color. Probably when they were coming out of the, the chrysalis. And that's the fluids coming off of the wings. Okay. Uh -huh. And the color is because of the colors of the wings. I wonder why I didn't have a clue. I know uh -huh. I hadn't heard them. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I was curious. Yeah. A rosy looking color. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. And then there are butterflies, like the black swallowtail, if you raise those right before you, uh, they uh, pupate or make their chrysalis, they purge. And it's, uh, <laughs> so dark stuff, you know, they, they lose it all and then they go up and they, and I have one right now that's just gone in, uh, into, a, they're not a J, they're a, they actually look more like, they attach like this. So I've got, you can see it went on your way. I'll show it to you. I've always got something in the kitchen in the summertime. And thinking in my head, your mother being a nurse, she thought this is some, some of the same. Uh, yeah, I wasn't, a, she taught us not to be squeamish. Yeah. <laughs> so much. You're taking care of things. And, like and when my son was in junior high, I was, big time raising butterflies and that was when I got nicknamed the butterfly mom and it just eventually mor morphed into the butterfly lady. Okay. But his friends always laughed because they'd come to our house and, and the island in the kitchen always had caterpillars in containers on in it. And so they just called me the butterfly mom. I probably stood and watched them for a while too. Yeah. Yeah, but it was kind of a joke. <laughs> <laughs> could be worse things. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now they'll be having some on their counter at some point. Do they do you have grandchildren? I do. And are they fascinated with it? They're um, not not as far. Nobody's like me. <laughs> Nobody else in the family is a better friend Earth. Um, <laughs> They were in Laos, and that's and I made many trips over, and that's how come I have the butterfly from there. But they found like the huge moth that's over there, and and I did like if I find things when I was over there, like caterpillars and stuff, stuff I set them up for them to raise and everything. And then um, they're in Florida now, and I planted milkweed where they live, so they've had monarchs and stuff. So, uh, but they're not they're sports kids. And so um, the the youngest one, mm, a little bit, but I don't think either one of them is going to go into the field of science. Darn it. Yeah, but anyway. Like still education and art and all that can go uh -huh. into it with oh, yeah. both uh -huh. so different directions. Yeah, and, and I don't get to be, I've never ever had them um, around to really indoctrinate them it's like getting to see them once every six months or so. So, you know. Mm -hmm. Not to see the process of caterpillar no. to no, 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 the whole process. No. Yeah. So they don't get to kind of see Nana's uh, a lab in the, ki in the kitchen in the summer and stuff. I bet they still tell stories about that, though. Oh, I'm sure my daughter does. <laughs> Her crazy mom. <laughs> but they don't require a great deal. No, mm -mm. Of attention, or mm -hmm. and they're not noisy. No, uh -uh. no. They just make poo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that part either. Mm -hmm. But it makes sense. I mean, no. Yeah. But and, and with monarchs, when they're they're voracious eaters, when they get close to pupating, so you have to clean them out two or three times a day. Mm -hmm. So because they make so much grass and everything, and then and then the food, collecting the food. So if I have a hundred, I'm raising. It's a full time job. It really is. 
Well, then I should scratch my comment then and not much work, but it, it is worth it. It can be, yeah, the more you have. Now, if it's just a couple or so, or a handful, five or something, it's not that big a deal. So that period of time might be four or five weeks that you're having to do that um, consistently? Yeah, uh, the spring, it got pretty crazy. And the only thing good about, like, if it's spread out, um, and I gave, like, Jane, I gave her 80 eggs, so she took eggs from me, and I gave eggs to different people, and I do that. Like, I might have, one year I had 900 eggs laid in the yard on my milkweed, wow. and I think I raised, I don't, I was thinking I raised maybe 600 that summer, but I gave away 300 to people to raise, and, and some of them went in the classroom, and some of them went to individuals and then and then um, um, I'm, and it's kind of contagious um, we planted a monarch waste station at our church <laughs> so and we're kind of butterfly crazy at the church <laughs> so and we have a, a community garden as well which we share the produce from with you know people so plant nectar plants and we do a community garden is vegetables and stuff which we give out to people in the community so that we have that but we we do have a monarch we have a monarch way station there and uh and uh, we raise uh we do have butterflies and uh and several people have gotten into it big time <laughs> so so i'm gonna ask you how long would it take you to count 900 well, it's over a whole year, a whole, and it's just a matter of like this year. I've been keeping track for Monarch Watch. We're keeping track for of um, monarchs coming through, and so hopefully, people that are seeing monarchs are report are keeping a calendar, and then um, and then they had us fill out a form at the end of a, a period as to what days we saw monarchs, how many monarchs we saw over a period of time. And they're doing that for all over the U.S. people. And I try to encourage, I said the, through the Facebook group, I encourage people to report to Monarch Watch and to Journey North. And then I do a group called Butterflies of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas, which has over a thousand members, and that's all kinds of butterflies. So on a typical day, what might you do? I do a lot of, I might, I, I might get on the Facebook and answer questions and identify uh, butterflies for people and stuff. Um, I, I'm always probably spending some time, some, a considerable amount of time outside working in the garden, just trying to keep it um, weeded and, and whatever needs to be done. and. Um, and then, of course, just, you know, laundry and whatever else. Uh -huh. But I do, most, you know, I, uh, and, I, and I mow, and I take care of things around here. So what you see is, you know, I do, I'm, I'm the gardener. Well, I'm just envisioning you spending it for a spare minute cruising the streets looking for No, 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 I don't do that. No, I don't have any monarchs now that I have to take care of. But, like, I went on the count last week. Uh, a lot of times, and I haven't done it as much this year, but I will spend, I will go, I may take a day off and go to certain places I know where there are butterflies and just spend time looking and seeing what's Enjoying. flying. Uh -huh. yeah. What's your happy, this, happy place? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is. And I have a swing out there that I sit in in the evening and I can watch the garden. And I have hummers, I have hummingbirds, but I don't put, I don't put, um, the nectar out for them. They literally feed on the flowers. And I think I may have a nest out there right, in a plant, but I don't know. Do they like caterpillars? Remember? They, you know, they may eat little bitty ones because I know that they feed insects to the baby chicks. I'm and just encouraging about that yeah, balance and yeah. make sure and, and I know that there are I have all kinds of birds out in the backyard too and I'm, I know that some caterpillars end up that's so, nature too yeah. Yeah. and I have like I have this plant growing up in the backyard and I don't treat the lawn but I try to keep it mowed so my neighbors don't turn me in but like I have dandelions and I had all kinds of weeds this spring 
and but I saw monarchs nectaring on the dandelions coming through. And then there's a weed called cudweed, which is kind of a, a light green weed that comes up and it came up really pity and American ladies laid their eggs on that. So I have a, a bumper crop of American ladies. And most and I left those outside to pretty much raise themselves. So I have pipe vine and I have pipe vine butterflies laying eggs every day on that and and so those butterflies are gorgeous and they're flying they fly uh, red admiral butterflies uh, lay eggs on a plant out there and I need to look and see if there's some caterpillars because normally the spiders eat all of my red admiral caterpillars mm -hmm. but spiders is another thing they love uh, caterpillars and butterflies well, that's, and that's all that contributes to not too many of them making it to adult too. No, uh, -uh no. Mm -hmm. But then there probably be too, would be too many if if everything, mm -hmm. you know, it's a it's balance. So you have to check all this before you mow to see if you got any out there. Yeah, you know, I I do check for like when the American ladies were uh, making their nest and they literally make a, a little nest and you can see the nest and and I would I might pick them break them off and bring them in and put them in a container to raise them if I found them out there and I knew I was going to, I wouldn't, I don't like to be responsible. <laughs> I break for butterflies. <laughs> well, that, that's maybe a good place to stop, but that's a, that was a great comment. You break for butterflies, even on the Route 66. <laughs> Because uh, that's something I read too that there's fatalities. I had thought about that too, but why they were a problem with having it up and down mm -hmm. the yeah, that's been mm -hmm. the fatalities. Mm -hmm. You don't think of that. Mm -hmm. Usually, even that word with the, with the or I don't, with butterflies, mm -hmm. but on vehicle side, so, you know, all these different things have come into play. It's a fun hobby. It's probably more than a hobby, though, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. it? It becomes more than a hobby. Yeah. Not retired. It's, you're not and retired. then, yeah, and then becoming a monarch watch, that was last fall. I went to a, Oklahoma has a lot of things going on, which you probably found out about, that are, um, they're working on a, um, um, basically, um, a whole, um, Conservation plan? A plan, yes, okay. conservation plan. Uh, and uh, there's a, there are people from all over the, the Oklahoma that are working on that. And um, the I went to a meeting in Oklahoma City and I wondered why I was there and that was because of Dr. Mom, because it was mostly agency people. And while I was there, we had to give a short bio about what we did, and I always introduce myself as a, a citizen scientist because that's what I am. Everything I've learned has been from um, just hands on mostly about monarchs and stuff. And so, Dr. Chip Taylor, who is the founder of Monarch Watch, and you may want to look him up, he's, he, he's 79 years old right now, and he, Monarch Watch has been in existence for mm, maybe 20 years, I think, out of Lawrence, Kansas, KU. And it, if nobody else has sent you that way, I'm sending you to some different things. I've emailed him a time or two. Okay. He's just so busy. Oh, he's I very busy. trip up to see him. Okay, that's fun. Um, he, um, after I gave my bio and kind of what you've heard to, here today, he came up afterwards and he said, would you become a Monarch Watch Conservation Specialist? So there are 20, uh, 23 of us across the U.S. Wow. And um, so I'm on the Monarch Watch uh, website, and I, I think I've sent you that. So, and it's just a little bio. But basically, what happened, and, and I got so busy this spring as I was uh, going and taking my table, and I have a, all this stuff that I pass out to people, and I gave them free seats, and, and then did a lot of, pre I did presentations across this part of Oklahoma. Stuff. So yeah. being a member, it's a little work. Yeah, it's, and it's a volunteer, and we're all about the same age, I've noticed, uh, <laughs> across there, that there's a page, the Monarch Watch Conservation Specialist of all of us, showing us, and there's some 
people in there that are pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Written books. Oh, you're pretty amazing too. I oh, think. thank you. <laughs> you could write a book, I guess, too, but of your experiences, how to be a citizen scientist. Mm-hmm. Small, big, dream big. Mm-hmm. So around that table, I know, I know they're working on a state plan. They haven't mm-hmm. quite got there. I think mm-hmm. it, from last person said it's supposed to be in the next month or so. Maybe they're getting their first draft. Of it, but I'm not no, sure. they're working. I, I'm working on one of the committees, so mm-hmm. I'm getting close to getting in. Mm-hmm. So around the table, how many other people? I mean, when you say agencies, you've got a Department of Transportation, maybe. Uh huh. Brad, um, Brad Murth, ODOT. He's responsible for a lot of the the um, uh, new um, um, practices in not mowing uh, at certain times and protecting them. And there's uh, and they came out with an article which came out on Facebook recently. Uh, so um, and I was trying to think. Yeah, all sorts of agencies. The conservation group that you're talking about in Oklahoma, um, there's um, uh, parks and rec people involved. There's uh, some uh, big landowners were involved in the meeting, in, in, and I didn't get to go to the meeting in Texas. Um, I made the decision that everything has to come out of my pocket and it was going to be down in Austin and it was just going to be a little pricey so I chose not to do it. So maybe a dozen people or so around the table? Oh, here in Oklahoma? Yeah. Oh, we, we had More 70 than. some people I think wow. at that meeting. More. Yeah. Um, there's a zoo. Uh, keeper a zoo like Rick Katarski at the Tulsa Zoo, the lady in Oklahoma City Zoo. Um, there's Nature Conservancies. There's several people from there. There was National Fish and Wildlife reps, and there was there was um, it was there was a lot of people. I it was more bigger than I thought. Oh uh, yeah. I had read somewhere where mayors, there's something that mayors can The Mayor's do. Monarch Pledge. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And Broken Arrow took it. And, and we have a committee called BAM, Broken Arrow Monarch Movement. And we're having a meeting, so I've worked with that. And, uh, Are most mayors across the, the state involved or interested? Well, I don't know. know. I I tried. I worked with a group that was in Tulsa for a while, and it wasn't a real good fit for me. But I encouraged them because some of them were familiar with the mayor, and that was when our old mayor, Bartlett, was there. And now we have our new mayor to get him involved because Tulsa is an area that is doing putting in a lot of way stations. Locally, there's a lot of people here who are... Um, very um, conservation minded and um, but it hasn't happened and I did go um, Bartlesville I went to Bartlesville I worked with the tol- the uh, Bartlesville um, Garden Club they did get their mayor to sign it okay. and I actually made the connection with them with the guy in um, Broken Arrow so that they could talk about you know what is involved and things like that yeah okay so I, I do. I make connections, mm-hmm. too. That's good. That means someone has to, mm-hmm. or, or yeah. it needs to be done. Mm-hmm. You do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, you've connected a lot of people to butterflies all around. I would say. Mm-hmm. You have a favorite memory for for an experience or whatever for their concern. Monarchs. Mm-hmm. Monarchs. I love the memory of the year that they were everywhere, and I was at school and I remember opening the door to go out in the playground and they were just, the air was full, and I remember going home, and I think there were two years, one year, we didn't live here, we lived in our house where I did the first butterfly garden, and the air was full of the monarchs and they were all over the plants, and I remember that just being just a really special 
something. I've never had seen a big roost. And I think if I were to go to Mexico, that would probably, and maybe this next year I'll get to go, I don't know. That would be a memory. That would be amazing. Top it. Yeah. Is there something about the butterfly that the average person doesn't know, the monarch that the average person might not know? Well, probably that um, they, their lifespan is normally about a month, that the female can lay hundreds of, hundreds of eggs. In that time period. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, they can't be very big if <laughs> she lays that many eggs. No, they're, they're little. Uh huh. And you have to you get to the point where you can spot them. Uh-huh. Don't need a magnifying glass. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. Bifocals. <laughs> no, not really. No, you can see them with the naked eye if you know what you're looking for. I think the most interesting thing I didn't know about them too is the you know that it takes the so many generations to make the trip mm-hmm. from. Yeah, you know, I just didn't think about that. And part. I think nobody knows that until they really start learning about them. And yeah, I didn't know that either. And you wonder, I wonder, I'm sure there's a scientific reason how they, their direction, their sense of direction, there's got to be something that tells them they're going north or south. Well, and Dr. Taylor made a comment when I was talking to him, and he's fascinating. I, I always like to be around him just to hear what he, you know, what he knows. Um, that they don't smell the milkweed, they see it. Hmm. And I thought, well, that's really wild. And I've always had wondered if they're, if they don't, um, um, like the monarchs that are from here in my backyard in the fall, if they don't imprint, and if, and some of the, and when I get a monarch that does come back in the spring, all the way, I've wondered if they're returning to where they were released, and I have no idea on that. That's something they don't know, but I've wondered about that. I wonder how they could, they'd have to How do they it find it? it? Yeah. How do they find my place? I mean, you know. Yeah. yeah. And one, I, I, I can tell you one thing that was really amazing is that one year, it was one of the years I was doing the, the, the farmer's market, so I had all kinds of little milkweed growing out on the patio. I mean, the patio was covered with milkweed plants. And the patio was always covered with plants. And this very, very tattered and worn female showed up. I knew she'd come from Mexico. And she laid eggs for five days on every single milkweed plant I had. Now, those were the ones that I raised and put in the sacks and sent home with kids to watch that year. And... um, that was probably, I can't, that's probably eight or so years ago. But anyway, and then I found her dead. But she put her last efforts and she made it all the way. And I wondered, how on earth did she find me? How did she find, you know? Yeah, finding her dead. It's not, well, it's not a happy moment then. Well, she accomplished, I knew, you know, that's what happens after they've laid all their eggs, just they die and, and everything. But just, you know, that five days that she stayed here, and that was amazing that she came back, she was here, and she laid eggs every single solitary day. Well, and you wonder how many she had done before she got here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If she's that tattered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Oklahoma wind. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, I think that's probably a good memory. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. So you just watched her up? Every day I'd go out because I had to take care of those plants and stuff because I was... And you she'd know, be busy. Yeah, and there she would be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'd be... She, she was... She got to where, you know, she was... Uh, I could be out there with her and she wasn't... She'd just keep on. She was so set on getting all those... Intent, you know, I'm getting all those eggs laid. She was on a mission. Mm-hmm. She was. Sounds like they all have that inbred mm-hmm. in them too. They're on mm-hmm. a mission to get somewhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anything else we need to cover? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> We've covered a lot. We've covered a lot. Oh, this is important. The value of local garden clubs. Oh, the local garden clubs are amazing. Yeah, they're they're wonderful and have. 
the actually it was the Garden Clubs of Oklahoma. I don't know if you knew there, the the uh, governor signed a proclamation, a monarch proclamation. Yeah, she did, and nobody, not a lot of people know it, but it was on April twenty first. Of this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll have to look that up. Mm-hmm. And it's doing what? Just just um, proclaiming the importance of the monarch in Oklahoma, and and uh, just uh, you know. I don't have a copy of. Did they have some kind of a ceremony yeah, at the Capitol? We did. Mm-hmm. You went to go? Uh huh. And it poured okay. rain, and there wasn't a whole lot of people there, but we, we did have it. Uh-huh. It was a stormy, stormy day. The butterflies wouldn't have been flying then anyway. Mm-mm. But I had one with me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Of course. And yeah, I named him, I named him Proclamation. <laughs> <laughs> Should have been a she. Yeah, it was a he. <laughs> Just because the governor was a shame, yeah. but uh-huh. were you the only one with one? Oh yeah, I, I was the only person who brought the monarch. It was all women from it was it was open and it was the better the um the garden clubs of Oklahoma. They were responsible for going to the mayor and asking her to do that, and then they were the ones that held the celebration that day. Okay. Oh. So step two is good to in the mm-hmm. right direction too. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And there, and a lot of them are working across the state in their communities to to get the communities to um, establish uh, gardens. Well, um, milkweed plus uh-huh. plus flowering plants. Yeah. Like in Bartlesville, she'd be a person to talk to because uh, they're the ones that uh, encouraged and they're doing the work that encouraged the mayor. Okay. What's her name? Oh, um, you can tell me later if you want to remember. Um, I will. I'll tell you her name. I may have to look it up. I might be able to Google Bartlesville Garden Club and uh-huh. it too. And then there's the little the the uh, president of the Garden Clubs in Oklahoma, who's a Spitfire, and she's. And not just milkweed though, they're pushing the other other mm-hmm. But they're plants. but they're plant they're all all the plants that you know uh, for the monarchs and basically when you plant those there's plants for other pollinators. Yeah, others will come. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and the yeah, and pushing um, natives in particular, right. Okay. Well that's part of the grant is to do native Plants and the seeds that mm-hmm. the tribes involved, and there are a lot of plants that aren't natives that people can plant for butterflies too. But anything, you know, but yeah, zinnias they love anything that blooms. So. Not anything, but quite a bit, almost a lot. Well, there's things mm-hmm. they don't like that are bloom. That uh, and they ignore them. Oh. Mm-hmm. They don't pay a lot of attention unless there's nothing else, probably. Right. Yeah. Well, that makes sense too. Mm-hmm. And that's the one thing Monarch Watch has the Monarch Way Station program, and they have everything on there about what you need to plant to have a monarch garden. So it's all written out for you and everything. So. You have to learn how to spell those big words, <laughs> those big scientific names. Milkweed's, a different, milkweed's just a common name, and it's for something else. Asclep- there are Asclepias or Asclepias. Uh-huh. That's the species. Mm-hmm. You have to learn how to spell that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Milkweed's easier. Mm-hmm. You have some things blooming in the front of those coming in. That's not. Those are garden flocks, and they are natives. The part of them are. And then, uh, yeah, just uh, basically pentas, which are out there, are butterfly. I'll see butterflies on them. Well, the butterfly bush that you see at the at the like Lowe's or whatever, does do they actually attract mm-hmm. butterflies? They really do. Okay. That's good to know. Mm-hmm. Like lilacs or something too, like mm-hmm. similar to lilacs. Mm-hmm. It's a, a all different things coming together with, and it, it, they are the poster child for pollinators. Mm-hmm. That's what people have referred to them as. So that's reason enough to encourage them to mm-hmm. plant more mm-hmm. and more. Okay. Anything else you want to add? Oh, I think I. You, you said it. so. I usually end up my interviews with asking people how they want to be remembered. You know, when history's written about you, what? How do you want to be remembered? A good steward of the earth or God's uh, creation.
creatures and yeah. yeah. Not just a butterfly lady, but mm-hmm. for the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I certainly thank you for spending time with me this morning, mm-hmm. and I, I hope butterflies keep flying and, mm-hmm. and making the trip. So thank you. Mm-hmm.